Okay, welcome and good evening. Uh, my name is Samir Gandesha, and I'm the director of the Institute for the Humanities. Uh, I'm also a professor in the Department of Humanities, and it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome you um, tonight to this dual award ceremony, first for the um, Mahatma Gandhi Annual Student Award, and then also the Tekor Visiting Scholar Award. Um, before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge that this event is taking place uh, on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, um, the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, and so uh, what will happen this evening is, first of all, I'm going to call um, Mr. Arvin Takor, uh, who's representing the Takor family and the Takor Foundation, um, to come up and present the Mahatma Gandhi uh, Student Award. So Arvin, please come on up. So dear friends, uh, welcome to the workshop, which is organized as a joint partnership between Institute for Humanities, Thakur Charitable Foundation, J.S. Woodward's Chair in the Humanities, and W.A.C. Bennett Library. The Mahatma Gandhi Annual Student Award was established at Simon Fraser University in 2007. It is funded through the generous contribution of the Thakur Charitable Foundation with the support from the Institute for the Humanities at SFU. The purpose of this award is to recognize and honor those SFU students who, in the spirit of Gandhi's work, have been active in voluntary community service in areas related to peace, justice, and human rights. The 2022 Student Award is Antonia Kowalewski. She is a fifth year biological physics student at Simon Fraser University with a shared passion for science, climate activism, and social justice. Her current role at SFU includes co-president of the Environmental Advocacy Club, Man the Bottle, student representative on the University Reuse for Good and Circular Economy Working Groups, founding member of the Department of Physics, Inclusion, Diversity and Equality Alliance, peer tutor for the Faculty of Science and regular volunteer for science outreach events. Beyond the walls of SFU, Antonia has also worked with the BC Sustainable Energy Association to train high school students to become climate leaders in their communities. I call upon Antonia to receive the award. I would like to say a big thank you to the Takor Foundation and the Institute for the Humanities um, for investing in the next generation through awards like these. This is something that I try to carry forward in my own work. I'm working with fellow university students, with high school students, and with elementary school students. Um, and I would also like to extend my appreciation for the recognition that um, climate justice and climate um, the climate crisis is a, human, is a humanitarian crisis. Um, I think it's really important to recognize that. And again, that's something that I try to think about um, in my work with climate and environmental activism as well. So thank you again. Thank you. Thanks very much, Arvind. Um, yeah, well, I mean, this award ceremony has a tremendous uh, meaning for me in so far as we get to honor our, our students, but our student activists. And, you know, I came to SFU in 1983, and I think in some ways that was a kind of last gasp of the, the radicalism and the student engagement from the 1960s and the late 1960s onward. I mean, SFU was founded in 65, and you know, in a couple of years, uh, it was a hotbed of, uh, of real engagement. Uh, it was really one of the most progressive universities in the world at that time. Um, so I like to see students keeping faith with, with that spirit in, in different ways. Um, and there are some of us, there are certain units at SFU also try to keep kind of institutional uh, faith with that. And, and I know one of, one of those units is um, uh, the uh, 
Woodward Center for Community Engagement that uh, that Am Joe Hall is uh, is leading and is doing a tremendous uh, um, job there, and we really uh, are delighted to work with him at any opportunity. Um, and we ourselves try to try to do the same, uh, try to f carry forward conversations that can be challenging and difficult. Um, maybe a bit conflictual, but very necessary in this time of climate emergency. Um, so it's, um, it's a tremendous honor then to be able to uh, present this award, the Takor Visiting Scholar Award, um, which has been uh, awarded annually since 1991 here at SFU. It honors individuals who have devoted their lives to creativity, commitment, and a deep concern for truth in public life something that cannot be underestimated in these days and times, which includes, but is not limited to, showing the connection between academic values and critical public spirit. The award also recognizes a commitment to Gandhi's ideal, um, ideals of truth, nonviolence, and social justice, religious tolerance, education, and ethics in politics. In addition to these principle, um, principles, uh, the award adds racial equality, and a concern for balance between industry and the environment. I'm very pleased to say that this year's recipient is SFU 350 for their commitment to climate justice and systemic change in solidarity with intersecting movements. So just a word about SFU 350. I think um, all four representatives of the organization will introduce uh, themselves uh, when they come up uh, to the podium. But just to introduce the organization, um, SFU has a rich history of student activism, to which I just alluded. Uh, and recent years have um, thankfully seen an uh, upsurge in climate-related uh, actions. SFU 350 is a student-led group dedicated to engaging the university in climate justice. And while recent victories have been encouraging, the group is eager to continue striving for greater changes. And well, you should. Um, operating on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, on which SFU um, is based, um, SFU 350 has been active since 2013 uh, and takes its name, SFU 350, because 350 um, per uh, million, parts per million of uh, carbon represents, or CO2 represents a safe amount of carbon dioxide for our atmosphere. Currently, we sit at over 400 uh, parts per million of CO2. SEFU 350 is dedicated to creating meaningful impacts through various campaigns by directly lobbying, lobbying those in power. SEFU 350 has generated impetus for positive change at the highest level. The club ensures equity, sustainability, and indigenous sovereignty. Um, uh, ensures that these things are centered in all campaigns and has a dedicated working group active in the express purpose of advocating for climate justice. So please, a round of applause for SFU 350. Welcome everyone. Um, I don't know, I'm trying to decide if I should stand or sit with my colleagues from 350. <laughs> for now, I suppose I'll, I'll stay sitting. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Thank you so much for this award. Um, we're thrilled to accept it on the behalf of 350. Um, and I would also like to point out that none of our actions would be possible without those years of previous effort from many students at the university. As you said, the club is from 2013. And over the, that almost 10 year period, there's been um, an enormous amount of uh, time and effort dedicated to climate justice by those previous students. And so we really would also like to extend our gratitude to those students as well, the alumni of SFU and the alumni of SFU 350. Uh, so maybe just a round of applause for our previous students as well. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so we do have a, a nice little PowerPoint to go through for you. And then we also do have some questions as well that I'll be asking my fellow panelists up here. Sorry, is everyone able to hear me? I feel like I'm not quite speaking into the mic. Yeah, maybe a little higher. 
Is that better? Or maybe I'll just talk louder. <laughs> Could be that. Maybe I'm whispering. All right. OK, uh, so um, my name is Liam. I am going to be your, your chair for today. And uh, we are going to have some more in-depth introductions for my fellow panelists as well. Before I do that, I have a brief little intro to the club, uh, similar to what you were saying as well. Oh. Great. Uh, so the work of SFU350 occurs on the unceded territory of the Tsleil-Waututh, Coquitlam, Squamish, and Musqueam nations. Unceded means that the land was never surrendered, relinquished, or handed over in any way. We continue to be on these occupied lands, and therefore, uh, we as people living and working on the lands must always center our movement around indigenous rights and sovereignty. And this is one of the, the founding principles of the club, centering indigenous rights and sovereignty. It's very important to our, uh, to our group. Now, what is 350? You already mentioned 350 stands for 350 parts per million, and that's the, the safe threshold of CO2 in the atmosphere. But the actual group itself is a student-led club organizing for climate justice. We mobilize for systemic change in solidarity with intersecting movements. And there's two things that I would like to point out here with this mission statement that we have. The first thing that I want to point out is that we focus on systemic change. Our club is one of many climate action groups on campus, and they're all doing excellent work. But 350 primarily focuses on more of a top-down approach. So it pushes for institutional or systemic change rather than individual change. Okay. Now, I would not, I'm, I'm not trying to slight the other groups in any way. They're all doing fantastic work as well. We just have different approaches to what our climate actions are. The second thing I'd like to point out is that we work in solidarity with intersecting movements. So those groups that I mentioned, we actually do work a lot with them as well. Um, so 350 is only one of a collection of climate groups, and all of these climate groups working together help to push SFU to make meaningful change. Your panelists for today are going to be myself, Liam Mackay. I am an environmental science student at SFU, and I'm one of the core leads of SFU 350. I'm also going to be your chair for today, so I'll be directing the discussion. And then I'll pass it off to my, my fellow panelists to also introduce themselves. Sky, would you like to go? Thank you so much, Liam. Actually, I actually might take this out of the... Perfect. Um, thank you so much for having us to here today. Uh, yes, briefly, uh, my name is Sky No. I use she/her pronouns. I'm currently in my fifth year taking sustainable business at SFU, um, and I am our current co-lead of the Divestment and Reinvestment Working Group. Hi, everybody. My name is Paige Hunter. Uh, I use she/her pronouns. I'm a resource and environmental management student at Simon Fraser University, and I'm also the Education Working Group lead. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Pranjali, so the emphasis is on the first A, but you can call me whatever. <laughs> um, I'm the co-lead for the social media working group, so I look towards the social media, um, graphic design, and um, editorial writing side of things. Uh, I'm in my third year for communications and international studies. Um, I'm really beyond honored and glad to be presented with this award, so thank you so much once again. Awesome. Uh, and maybe could we have a quick round of applause just for my fellow panelists up here. Apparently, we're doing lots of applauses today. Um, maybe we'll hold off on the applause for a while. OK, uh, I'm actually going to pass it back off to Skye. And she's going to give a brief overview of what the history of the club is. For sure. Thank you so much, Liam. Oh, yes, and it, it angles down. Perfect. Um, that's amazing. So just taking you guys through a brief history of what SFU 350 has really gone through since its inception in 2013. Um, really, our group hasn't received as much press and recognition as it has now. And as Liam had mentioned earlier, um, we are very grateful for our past alumni um, for the dedication and hard work that they had put in um, in these past almost 10 years when the club was founded. Um, in 2013, we can clearly see uh, SFU 350 was created and the first campaign, Divestment from Fossil Fuels, was created as a petition. From then on, SFU 350 had hosted um, many events uh, and also had uh, its first meeting with the Board of Governors where actually SFU 350 had signed on to the UN Principles of Responsible Investing. And in addition, the Responsible Investment Committee was actually created because of the advocacy of the alumni of SFU 350. From then on, SFU 350 had hosted major events, um, such as their Reinvest for Our Future 
uh, for our future campaign. Um, and this included many different alumni uh, from our previous group, as well as different professors that had been involved. Another addition to this in the year prior, in the year uh, in the future, was the formation of the Climate Coalition, which is a group of through SFU 350, Embark Sustainability, as well as Change SFU. And one of our larger milestones happened actually in 2020 um, when the Board of Governors had announced uh, that they would be reducing the carbon footprint of their portfolio by 45% by the year 2025. And this had become um, because of the work that SFU 350 had been doing prior to this commitment. And of course, if you had been following um, us in the news or SFU in the news, you had recently seen in November that SFU had committed full divestment to, from fossil fuels from their endowment portfolio last year. I will now be passing it back to Liam, uh, back to Paige, uh, for a, a bit of a background on our climate emergency declaration campaign. Yeah, thank you. So one of our biggest movements in the last year has been the Climate Emergency Declaration Campaign. Um, the actual campaign ran from August till September 2021, um, and we were trying to uh, get SFU to do a multitude of actions, including to declare a climate emergency, as well as commit to uh, seven main actions and demands that would help SFU both mitigate their climate emissions and adapt to the climate emergency. So although the campaign ran from August till September 2021, we had a very long and comprehensive consultation phase that was over a year and a half um, with student groups as well as community members before we ran the campaign in 2021. Uh, in this time, we were regularly attending Board of Governors meetings uh, to continue to let them know of our demands and our plan for this campaign. Um, and we were organizing on campus, uh, both virtually during COVID, as well as once we started to go back to campus, we started to organize in person, uh, such as through our climate emergency mural, which you can see behind me. In the end, we received over 1,500 signatures on our campaign, and that is both from individuals on campus as well as larger coalitions of students. Um, so this was a big, big win for us uh, as, a, as a group. So I'll just quickly go through some of our demands. The first one was uh, decarbonization, so to fully decarbonize the university as much as possible in line with the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. To divest, uh, to divest SFU's investments and portfolio from all fossil fuel developments and fossil fuel adjacent industries, um, and to commit to exploring and implementing reinvestment of those funds in partnership with SFU 350. Uh, we are also looking to raise awareness and amplify um, those that are involved in new and pending fossil fuel projects and to uh, openly oppose those projects that are not aligned with both the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change as well as those that do not have the free, prior and informed consent of the host nations on whose territories those projects are taking place. Another one of our demands was the Climate Hub. Um, so to really have a funded and established student-led Climate Hub for um, SFU students where they can go and learn about climate change topics, uh, climate justice, as well as be a body to guide sustainability and climate policy on campus. Uh, and moving into climate justice, uh, we demanded that the university implement a climate justice lens to all future climate actions at SFU, um, because Antonia mentioned, you know, the climate crisis is also a humanitarian crisis. Uh, educate, we really want to make sure as well that all SFU st students, regardless of what major they're in um, and what year they're in, we want to make sure that they all graduate with an understanding of both basic climate change science as well as climate justice. And finally, we want them to determine what their next steps are. So to initiate a formal process to develop specific actions that they are gonna take and how they're gonna measure progress, um, as well as to report back by April 2022. So this is still a work in progress, but um, ideally, uh, in line with our climate justice demand, this would also be undertaken with um, the host nations at SFU, so the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Coquitlam nations. And I will pass it on to Liam. <laughs> All right, thanks Paige for that uh, overview of the CED, the Climate Emergency Declaration Campaign. Um, now, 
after this campaign concluded, which was last year, as you heard her say, in September, we actually restructured the club in order to push SFU to actually follow through on their commitments. So as Paige said, we did uh, send this letter off to the Board of Governors, and we presented the, the demands to the Board of Governors. And as I'm sure you can expect, it takes them a while to get back to us. So it took them about four months or so to finally get back uh, with a response. But actually, I'm, we're, we're quite happy to say that they did uh, vote for principled alignment with the demands of the letter. So SFU basically said that they agreed with our demands. And now it comes to us to actually push them to follow through, right? Uh, that's the whole purpose of the student body. So they agreed with the demands and they said, we like where you're going with this. But now, as students, we need to structure our club in order to actually make sure that they are accomplishing each of those seven demands and that the ones that they are on track to accomplish, that they're not slipping, that they're not falling back. So we restructured into working groups, as you can see up here on the board, and now we have nine active working groups that are all dedicated to pushing SFU to follow through with these demands. So I'll briefly go through uh, each of the working groups so you can kind of see how it works. As you can see at the top there, we have the social media group. The social media group, as the name suggests, runs our social media. But they also do a lot more than that. They do graphic design and op-ed writing, media engagement, pretty, en pretty much anything involving like media of any form, the social media team handles. We have an education working group. And this working group is trying to make sure that every single undergraduate student graduates with an understanding of climate change. So every undergraduate degree should contain some climate component in that degree. Because as Paige said, climate change is a humanitarian crisis. It's not just influencing science majors, right? Every single major is influenced by it. The Divestment and Community Reinvestment Group is focused on trying to get SFU to divest their funds from fossil fuels and to reinvest those funds into the local community. As Sky pointed out, SFU has announced that they are going to be divesting fully from fossil fuels by 2025. So this is one of those working groups where we're not just pushing them to do something, we're also holding them accountable. So the divestment group monitors the financial statements, makes sure that SFU is actually on track to fully divest and then to reinvest that money. The Raise Awareness and Amplify group, as Paige had mentioned, uh, they are focused on amplifying the, the voices of those fighting against new and pending fossil fuel projects. The most relevant project to SFU students is the Trans Mountain Expansion Pipeline. So this working group is mainly focused on amplifying knowledge about the TMX. So you'd be surprised how many students on campus aren't really aware of what the construction is on Gallardi. They drive to school and they go, I don't know what that construction site was. Well, it's a pipeline being built right at the bottom of the mountain. And so this group is all about raising awareness about that pipeline, about fossil fuel projects. The decarbonization group is trying to ensure that SFU is decarbonizing their operations in line with those IPCC standards, with those intergovernmental panel on climate change targets. And this is another group where it's more of a monitoring group. SFU is actually on track to surpass their targets. We just need to make sure that they follow through with that, right? We, we monitor the reports, we check the, the emission reports and make sure that they're actually following through on their commitments. The Climate Hub Group is trying to establish a student-led Climate Hub on campus where students and staff and faculty and researchers can collaborate on projects together. The Climate Justice Group is making sure that SFU is implementing a climate justice lens in all of their actions and policies. So anytime they implement a new climate-related action, we need to make sure that it is viewed through an equitable and just lens. The Ad Hoc Group works on short-term ad hoc projects. Sometimes other groups will come to us with a, a request for a letter of endorsement or something along those lines. So the ad hoc group will quickly get together, they'll draft up the letter, they'll send it off, and then they'll disband. So it's really for those short-term projects. And then finally, there's the core leadership group, which is myself and a few other people. And we handle more of the administrative stuff. So room booking, grant writing, all that sort of stuff. All the fun things, right? So that's the current structure of the club. It is kind of complex, as you can see, um, but we have quite a few students who are very passionate about this work, and so it works well. Because if you have a student who's not super interested in all of these things, they can only join that specific working group if they choose. For example, we have students who are business majors and they're really into the financial aspect of divestment. So they can join the divestment group and they can attend those divestment meetings and push for SFU to continue on their divestment path. They don't have to join every single meeting. We found that it works quite well for our club and I'm sure we're gonna continue using this model as we go forward. 
I'm going to pass it back actually to Pranjali now, and she's going to tell us more about the social media group. Thanks. I thought um, you're just going to take over and we'll just head into questions. But <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> because, well, social media, <laughs> it's um, definitely something that I found my interest in as a, as a research topic as well as um, seeing community engagement here in Canada, which is very different from where I come from. So it was really nice to see um, people getting together for a cause that they stand for. Um, that's what sort of like inspired my interest um, into social um, activism and also specifically climate equity and justice um, for social media working groups specifically. Um, we work for gaining support. As you can see um, that the climate emergency declaration, uh, we got over 1,500 signs um, from different groups and students, which was only possible, I would say, because of the social media group. <laughs> um, we were also able to raise awareness um, through our ongoing campaigns. Um, we were also the face of many campaigns, bringing together um, students through Instagram engagements, um, and stuff like that. Um, some of the past collaborations and announcements that have been really helpful in pushing through were the Hugdi Mountain, uh, which happened across um, around the um, Burnby Mountain. Then we also endorsed the Sioux Big Oil. Um, we also stood up with the Palestinian liberation policy. Um, so there's a list you can see on the website. I'm going to promote it. Um, you can find more about our past endorsements and collaborations there. Yes. Great. I'll pass it on to you. Thanks, Pranjali. And actually, uh, do you want to pass on the page, maybe? Yes. Nice. Hi, everybody. So I'm just going to talk briefly about the Education Working Group, which is the group that I lead as part of SFU 350. Um, we've had some really exciting projects in the last, I'd say, year and a half. Uh, for the last, uh, I'd say, year and two months, we've been working very closely with the SFU Sustainability Office who are in charge of implementing SFU sustainability policy and climate policy on campus for the most part. And we've been working with them uh, along with many other uh, students, staff, and faculty to develop a uh, climate literacy course for the university um, that will be free and open to students as well as uh, targeted for uh, staff and faculty so that it's not just students that have a climate education but that it's just embedded throughout the whole university and the education that everyone is getting. And another project we are working on that we recently started, we're working with uh, Embark Sustainability, which is a student-led and student-supported, um, as well as a permanently staffed organization on campus with um, a lot more funding <laughs> to install um, a more uh, static climate education board for students who we aren't necessarily able to reach with some of our other programming. Um, and this will have info on events, climate change courses, campus environmental groups that students can get engaged with, um, as well as uh, graphics and basic information on climate science. So we can't be everywhere all at once, so this is kind of our method of uh, reaching those students that we may miss with some of our engagement. Um, yeah, I will be talking a little bit about community reinvestment, which is the working group that I currently co-lead. Um, so after our divestment campaign was kind of announced as a victory, um, ongoing in the background before the divestment campaign had even been announced, uh, we had been working on a actually tri-university-wide campaign called community reinvestment. Um, and we have been working with CJUBC, which is Climate Justice UBC, um, as well as Divest UVic, which is the student group on campus um, at the University of Victoria on a joint campaign around community reinvestment. Um, and this campaign really entails uh, the what's next of divestment. So after institutions like SFU have declared that they will divest by a certain timeline, um, where are we going to move that capital and who is going to be impacted by the capital that we are moving? Um, and this campaign really ensures that the local community and social and environmental impacts are really benefiting from institutional money, um, such as through the SMFU's endowment, as well as through UVic's endowment, and hopefully as well as UBC. 
Um, and this, this actually potentially looks like investments such as looking into cooperative housing, into renewable energy products, into local food, food systems. Um, and this isn't really a new idea. Uh, impact investing and local community investing has been done um, at scale for a number of years. However, institutions such as universities haven't really bit the bullet in terms of joining in uh, to this type of investing. Um, so we really see this as an innovative way to really to redirect money into the local community uh, that actually provides not only financial returns, but social and environmental returns. And so really briefly walking through, we have a lot of de demands as you can see in this club. Um, and we have another set of demands for you here today uh, with the community reinvestment campaign. So really we had drafted these demands and as they are not fully um, in, into our, our hard launch yet. So we had did a, did a soft launch early uh, last year. Um, these are currently being reworked and worked on again because as we want to know, um, the students are really at the core of what we want to see incorporated into these demands. So we are currently working on student consultations. Our first demand really looks at how we can embed um, environmental and social uh, impacts into the investments of a university. And while this is very vague, um, we have been kind of consulting with industry professionals to be able to really incorporate this ask uh, into what we are, our current uh, conversations with the SFU's treasury is looking at. Our second demand is really looking into um, creating a new asset class, and this is the exciting part, to really contribute uh, working capital into uh, a new fund that would be able to fund community reinvestment projects, um, like I had mentioned at the beginning. Our third demand um, discusses how we really need to consult with the indigenous peoples that our, our schools reside on when it comes to where this money goes. Um, our universities are situated on unceded territories, and this really means that when we are making any sort of financial decisions that these projects and these uh, initiatives that we are funding through our endowments should not be actively harming the communities that we are um, residing on their territories. So this is a core uh, piece of our campaign. Um, at fourth, we would like to move all kind of more liquid assets into uh, institutions that don't have ties to fossil fuels. So currently, SFU banks with Scotiabank. Um, as we know, they are one of the top uh, funders of fossil fuel projects uh, within the country. And we know the top five banks have a lot of impact into what projects get sent forward. Uh, so we would really like to see uh, the university as well as other groups on campus, such as um, the student union, bank with more progressive uh, institutions such as credit unions. And lastly, we really want to share these findings with other institutions. This is a relatively new idea when it comes to institutional investing, and we really do believe that uh, with these asks, and hopefully um, as they move forward, we'll be able to kind of increase our impact exponentially as we're able to share with other groups across campuses, um, across the country, and hopefully across the world as well. And so upcoming, we have, um, as I had mentioned before, student consultations as really the students are the forefront of our campaigns. Um, and we really also wish to include their, their um, notions and their demands into our current working demands. We also are working on um, an info session with uh, professionals um, within the field of impact investing that will be able to share their findings from the impact investing field into institutional investors such as SFU's Treasury. Um, and lastly, we have kind of ongoing engagement uh, with the Treasury at SFU, uh, and we have a very good working relationship with them, which is always very positive to see. Um, and I will pass it on to Liam. Sure. Thank you to all three of our panelists. So that really was just a, a brief intro to three of the working groups. As we said, we do have nine others. Now, we're not going to go through the remaining six, but hopefully you get a taste of what they are like. Each working group has their individual demands, their individual goals that they're working towards, and they do that through separate campaigns, but we're still a large collective. We work together, we support each other, and we make sure that all of our individual campaigns are collaborating wherever possible. Uh, on the screen up here, we also have some ways that you can get involved. Now, if you are interested, there's a few options. Um, not many of your students here, I'm assuming, so we probably can't really join the club, but you can definitely follow our social media for those updates, and I'm sure Pranjali will have some exciting things coming down the pipe. Uh, so our, all our social medias are always just at sfu350.com, so Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, everything's always sfu350. 
And we also have our website as well, sfu350.com. And on that website, we have tons of information. We do have information about our past campaigns as well, previous actions we've done, um, previous endorsements that we've uh, provided for other groups, really just a bunch of information about everything the club is doing. Now, I have some questions for our panelists, and hopefully they're going to be able to give us some answers for these. Um, I do have a few questions that I'll go through, and then we'll give a chance for the audience to ask some questions as well. So my first question is actually going to be, uh, first guy, we'll start with you. And uh, the question is, what has been the biggest barrier to climate activism within a large institution like SFU? Yeah, for sure. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, I really believe that although SFU 350 has gotten so much recognition over the past little while, actually, um, there is a lot of red tape when it comes to working within the institutional boundaries. Um, although we have a great working relationship with the SFU Treasury in our working group, um, it, things haven't always been as smooth. Uh, working alongside the Board of Governors, as past alumni have told us, uh, there have been past condescending comments and dismissal from board members in the past. And we all know that there is a lack of transparency and accessibility when it comes to reaching certain board members um, and being able to be open and transparent um, with the current dialogue. Uh, so we know that there are a lot of issues when it comes to being able to engage with the university. However, um, as we continue pushing the university forward, we have found um, and formed new relationships with board members, with the chancellor, um, and with the treasury. So we we are eternally grateful for their um, being lent the, the voice of to be at the table, um, but it has taken a long time and a lot of uh, hard work and student labor from uh, unpaid students uh, to be able to sit at the table um, with all of these institutional members. Great. Thank you, Sky. And I'm going to ask the same question as well for, for Pranjali. Yeah, I think the hardest battles are fought within the system and like for the system. So it's like fighting for the system, which is like people, humans. And for that, we have to fight the humans and the people, which is like a um, ironical situation. Um, but I think as um, Sky was mentioning, it has not been a smooth road, but we are getting there. So amends and fixes for the system takes time and persistence. And I'm so proud to be in co the company of the people who have done it all, so. Sure. I have been just related with this club for a brief time, but it's been a superb journey. Yes. Paige, Thank you, Patrick. And Paige? Yeah, I was going to just reiterate what Sky said. I would say until the last uh, six to eight months, um, it's really been a bit of an uphill battle as a club, um, but we're so grateful to be getting um, some recognition for our work as well as, as, as we've said, the you know past eight years of alumni who we wouldn't really be here um, without them because they, they started it all. Um, I would say the biggest barrier um, that I've come across as the education working group lead has been time. Um, time is always something that we are uh, having to work with. The current issue is that we are in a climate crisis that demands that we take action as soon as possible. But also, you know, if you're doing equitable and just engagement, you need to have um, enough time for the right people to be engaged and to be engaged in a way that is really meaningful and not rushed. So that is, um, that is always on our minds, especially in the education working group where we are trying to engage students, staff, and faculty. Um, but it's been uh, really, that's where the SFU Sustainability Office has come in as an excellent partner because they have a lot of experience with managing large groups of people as well as managing, managing time. Thank you, Paige. My next question uh, is, how do you connect your work to larger movements outside of the SFU community? And we'll start with Sky once again. Yeah, for sure. Um, as I had mentioned, within the Community Reinvestment Working Group, we work alongside uh, UBC as well as UVic in their respective student groups to kind of push our institutions forward. Um, but outside of that, we also have been engaging with different uh, professionals and companies uh, just to kind of consult with them about kind of the financial intricacies. So we have talked to groups such as um, Rally Assets, um, Van City Community Investment Bank, uh, Social en Energy. And, and these groups have been amazing in terms of being willing to consult with us students um, and really providing the, the financial background and the know-how to bring forward this topic and these ideas to our treasury. Great. Thank you, Sky. And the same question for Pranjali. Um, we have been 
quite involved and have collaborated with many on-campus and on off-campus um, community organizations, including Embark. Um, then there is Divest Canada. Then there is um, ca uh, just Climate 350 itself. Um, also, just going to the previous question again, I think uh, Paige really mentioned about the importance of time because we are running a um, against the time. It's the climate clock is clicking is the phrase that we use. And I think for social media, um, getting the reach, um, reaching the students, being able to um, spread the awareness through social media is a tricky thing. And also getting, even if you reach the students, it is a tricky part because you don't know if that would change into some action. So there's a gap between an action and reach, which is kind of like a tricky part in social media. Um, yeah, that's about it. Page. Thank you, Patrick. And Paige? Yeah, I would say it, it um, depends on which campaigns we're working on. Our Trans Mountain uh, Pipeline campaigns have really reached very far outside the university, both connecting to movements across Canada that are in opposition of TMX, um, as well as student groups on campus, as well as the Burnaby Fire Hall and the city of Burnaby, for example. So that's um, a campaign where uh, you know, you have a lot of stakeholders who are interested or um, engaged on a certain issue. Um, but then you also have movements like our climate emergency declaration campaign where while we are more focused in the institution, we were engaging a whole variety of on-campus groups um, that would not necessarily, you wouldn't think they'd be associated with our group, but we um, really felt that their voices were important and their input was important to, to our demands. So I would say uh, one of the things we really focus on is, is going outside of our club, both on campus as well as off campus. Great. Thank you, Paige. My next question is, what's next for SFU 350? And maybe we'll say specifically for each of your working groups, what's next for your working group? Sky? For sure. Um, I had mentioned it previously a little bit, but we are currently working through student consultations um, when it comes to our demands, because at the end of the day, we want to see students first um, when it comes to their money within the endowment. Uh, we're also hosting um, an info session that will be coming up in the spring um, with impact investing professionals uh, that will kind of go over what it really means to do uh, impact investing at an institutional level, which is what our community reinvestment campaign is really surrounding. Um, and hopefully in the future, what I really hope for or the community reinvestment campaign is that we really spread the idea that institutions such as universities are really able to make an impact with their money, not just divest, not just um, screen certain holdings outside of their portfolio, but to make a true community impact where they're located and hopefully we can spread that message um, across the country. Great, thank you, Sky. And the same question, what's next for the social media group, Pranjali? I would say um, more Reels and more TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> um, but basically, um, just having all these campaigns out on our um, channels, getting more people to know what we're up to, and we're just the face of like SFU 350, so I think we will be you know, working on that, essentially, and also getting to activate the inner activism in the people. That would be our main role, yes. Great. Thank you, Bradley. And Paige, what's next for education? Yeah, I think um, that the climate literacy and sustainability education course that we are co-developing with SFU Sustainability, that is a multi-year engagement um, that we are conducting with them. Um, so that will be something that we'll be working on for at least the next two years. Um, our, our project with Embark uh, is, uh, sort of has a timeline for this school year, so hopefully we will have some kind of uh, more creative or artistic um, climate education board for students uh, in the student union building on campus by April is the timeline that we've set for ourselves. Um, as well as we have had some interest from a uh, higher level SFU administration to develop a database of existing SFU courses that are related to sustainability, climate communications, climate science, and um, many other like climate and sustainability re related topics. So um, we're really excited to potentially be working with them on that to um, make sure that all students, regardless of their major, um, know how they can learn more about these issues, how they can take action on these issues. And we're always striving to um, meet students that we haven't met yet and to get them to understand more um, of the climate literacy and education uh, skills that we want to pass on. 
Excellent. Thank you, Paige. Uh, can we get a, one more round of applause for our panelists there? Thank you for your answers. Um, now, at this point, at this point, we actually would like to open up the, the questions to the audience. I do have a few more questions prepared that I didn't tell them about. Um, but we'll open it up to the audience first. And if you have anything that you'd like to ask, now's the chance. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. And, and thank you for all your work and for your activism. I, I think it's really important. Um, there was something that I kept waiting for through your presentation, and, and it's an element that I think uh, can be, could be very uh, profitably infused into what you're doing and integrated into what you're doing, which is indigenization. Um, we're on this land, the people on this land are the keepers of this land, they know a lot. Uh, we're also in a process of reconciliation municipally, provincially, nationally, and globally. And I think uh, it would be very uh, useful and right to uh, put those perspectives into everything that you're doing, bring in people, liaise with more people, uh, uh, from indigenous agencies, groups, uh, nations, who know so much about these things, uh, and also who would say uh, nothing about us without us. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, I would really encourage everybody in SFU 350 to think about that, get it on your agendas, make it a big focus, because it's hard. Uh, to do it. So, yeah, that's, that's all I have to say, but yeah. thank you very much. Thank you for the, the observation and for the suggestion. And actually, um, we didn't really include it in the, in the presentation because it actually hasn't happened yet. But we do also have quite a close relationship with the Tsleil-Waututh Nation, um, in particular the Tsleil-Waututh Nation Sacred Trust, which you may have heard of that organization before. It's a, a group uh, quite prominently opposing the TMX. And actually, we did have a, a very exciting conference, like week-long festival type of event that we were going to be putting on this September. Now, unfortunately, that was delayed. Um, so hopefully, we'll be able to do that in the, the following semester in the spring. But the, the points that you raised are excellent, uh, excellent points. And I'm, I feel like there's always more that we can do to indigenize our groups and to incorporate that knowledge. Um, and I'm, I'm going to actually uh, go a little bit further right there. And, and you had mentioned that the indigenous knowledge is often overlooked. And I think that that's something, especially for myself in environmental science, that I, I see quite prominently. A lot of the time, the, the science that we study is very uh, Western imperialist. It's very uh, like white-centered science. And it's not incorporating a whole lot of indigenous knowledge that really could be a solution. Um, so I, I think that's, that's a very valuable and, point. And beyond that, uh, indigenous ways of, of organizing, uh, of relating between mm -hmm. groups and within groups uh, have a lot of uh, lessons for us too. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of reconciliation. That's the part where we really learn a lot, uh, an amazing amount. Uh, just by integrating what we do with, with uh, and uh, associating mm -hmm. with uh, native activists, and, and there are so many. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for sure, once we have this conference planned out, I, I'll, we'll be certainly publishing it on our website and sending all the information out, and we hope to see some of you there as well um, once it actually happens, hopefully in the spring. Um, I was incredibly impressed uh, by the work of your organization going back to 2013, but especially with each, with each one of you. You, you uh, speak so knowledgeably and with such eloquence about the work that you've been doing. Um, I, just kudos, you know, and, and very proud to um, present you with this award. Um, so I, I think you really hit the, the nail on the head when you talk about the climate crisis as a humanitarian crisis and one that entails a social justice response. It's not a, a technical or technocratic response. I think this is exactly the, the point about indigenization. Um, and I think it's really good to be focused and you know, very much aware of the fact that we at SFU are based on 
um, unceded territories, and so there's a real need to engage with uh, the nations on whose territories we're on. But there was something that happened this summer, of course, it gets us thinking beyond the local and the, you know, the truly global impact of the global north's um, impact on the world in terms of our disproportion disproportionate consumption and also then production of CO2 emissions, right? Thinking especially of the fact that at, at one point for several weeks, one third of Pakistan was underwater. Pakistan produces something like 1% of the world's um, uh, carbon emissions. It might be less even, actually. It might be less, yeah. um, but it's just it's a fraction of, mm -hmm. uh, of, of the kind of impact that the, that country has experienced and will continue to experience. So I'm, I'm, my question specifically, and you know, I was really impressed about this discussion of community reinvestment, and you're looking to the local, which is great, but is there any kind of discussion uh, of the, the need for justice at the, at, at the global level kind of reparations from the, the global north to the global south um, and ways of clearly and concretely um, engaging in remedial action um, and sort of strengthening the resolve and the resilience of these, of these societies to actually be able to, you know, continue to exist. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, I can want to jump in. Sure. Yes. Thank you so much for your question. Um, yeah, very eloquently said. And it's something that I think we all think about, um, well, when we go to bed at night and we think about really the impact of our work and what it really means, not only locally, but how that expands um, the reach potentially uh, throughout the globe. And, and one thing that we really aim to do at SFU 350 is share our work. And I think that is the, the big importance. And I, it's not reparations and it's not um, the immediate need um, that we are addressing, um, although we would love to be uh, addressing it. Uh, however, we do have an opportunity um, and I can share that uh, about myself and Paige as well, actually uh, will be headed over to Egypt uh, for COP27 this upcoming November, and hopefully we will be able to share our learnings, um, specifically, personally, um, thinking about the community reinvestment campaigns. So how can institutions across the world really be looking at um, the student groups uh, be pushing their institutions to reinvest in their local community and what that really means by taking their money out of big polluters um, that are really funding the fossil fuel, uh, really funding the climate crisis and how they're able to take that money and really put it into local benefits um, no matter where they are located in the world. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just add to that, that um, until we got the invite to attend COP27, it hasn't necessarily been a large focus of our club, but I would say that is the, um, one of the biggest things I know that I'm excited about is connecting what we're doing at Simon Fraser University to um, universities and institutions around the world to hopefully begin that kind of process, um, to have larger institutions in the global north, possibly, you know, any sort of relationship and reparations um, that can be done needs to be done, mm -hmm. right? And so I would say this is a really exciting opportunity that we've, you know, just been exposed to and are just starting to think about. So it's exactly. a really, it's an exciting time. We want you to be on the video. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm really impressed for what you guys did, and um, for for me, like I just have one question. I think, cause like for for like I'm a student myself. I always wonder like um, how do you guys? Cause you talk about like the social media. You guys talk about to get more views and more clicks. But like, how do you guys find a balance between promoting what you want and then at the same time attracting the people as, much, like, as many as possible? Because I usually find like that's a really difficult task. So I really wonder like, how you guys did it. Thank you. Thank you so much for the question. Um, I think um, I can speak to myself, like whenever I've taken the leadership role, um, we haven't posted anything for the clicks. Uh, we don't promote any brands or we haven't done any brand endorsements. Um, it's just community-based organizations, events that we promote. I know it can be hard and that's also part of my research interest. Um, 
which is seeing how do you have people on board uh, with activism and with um, engagements, as, as you said. Um, so we never go for clicks. <laughs> we just want to have more and more people to come together for a cause that they could relate to. Um, so yeah, I think I missed some part of your question, but yeah. Something, yeah. Paige, you can go. yeah, I would just say the biggest thing is making sure that we're promoting stuff through different channels. So we have, you know, the social media team isn't just using digital media, for example. They're also reaching out to the student newspaper, um, email campaigns, SFU administration. Um, and also we found that our climate emergency mural, for example, was um, a really effective method for getting people involved in our club um, because sometimes it is really hard through digital media to reach people, um, especially with the way the algorithms work. It's hard to get new people engaged um, in, this kind of, uh, in this kind of activism. So I would say in-person activism has been, uh, it's been exciting to get back to that on campus um, mm -hmm. and because that just reaches different people. Yeah, and I'll jump in very quick and then I'll pass it back off to you. Um, one thing that I've seen as well, when I joined uh, only last year, there was maybe six active members, <laughs> not very many. It was actually quite a small group. Uh, very effective group, they were all very passionate, but in terms of the core group of, of 350, there were not very many. And now we have close to 50. So there is that, that drive there in the student population. Um, and those in-person events have really got people out, things like the mural. When people hear about it, they want to help. Um, as you can see, it's grown a, a ton just over the past year. So there is that, that active student uh, community that would like to be engaged. And it's just a matter of making sure they're aware of the group. Um, I, I think you guys did a wonderful job uh, in presenting and making us more informed on the climate issue. Um, I just had a question. So how, how important do you think is it to stress upon the idea that climate change and, and uh, cl the climate crisis and the humanitarian crisis are quite interlinked in the turn of recent events in the world, um, such as Hurricane Ayana, Hurricane Fiona, um, we see how the coastal borders are being depleted and as my professor had mentioned earlier, the floods in Pakistan. So I was, I was thinking, how, how do you think it's important to link those two crises together? Mind if I jump in? Okay. Um, of course, it's, it's incredibly important. Um, now, one thing to keep in mind, as I had just said, we were a small group even up until last year. And there's only so much that we as students can do. But that being said, every little bit helps. So we talk about how this is a global crisis, how it's a humanitarian crisis, how there's intersecting crises. It's not just climate change, right? But we're students. We're in classes. We have jobs. We have lives. We have a limited amount of time that we can dedicate to this. And so as students, we try to channel in our effort where it is most valuable and where we are able to contribute the most. And so it is incredibly important that this is a global issue and it's an intersecting issue. And the majority of crises going on over the world are related to climate change. There's always connections between these crises. But as students, we, we need to make sure that we're not becoming overwhelmed. If we look at all of the problems going on and we try to solve every single thing, it can become disheartening. And we've actually found that with some of our students, it, they almost begin to suffer from that, that eco-anxiety where they feel like everything's lost, everything's doomed, right? There's too many problems going on at once. And so we make sure that the students are focusing on what they can do. And they're, they're playing to their strengths, they're doing what they're able to do, where they can contribute the most. And if everyone's contributing those little amounts, it does add up to a large change. Um, so I know this was kind of a roundabout way of answering your question. It is incredibly important, um, but it's also important to, to center yourself and to recognize that you individually might not be able to change everything, but every little bit that you do is going to contribute to that change. Thank you. For sure. Any other, what's there? Any other questions from the audience?
Thanks so much for your presentation. And I was particularly interested in the um, demands and ideas in the divestment and reinvestment section. And I'm wondering if you, um, how you're finding the reaction when you're talking to the Board of Governors and the Treasury uh, about some of these ideas, how much traction you're getting, um, in particular around our um, financial institution, considering our Chancellor was the former CEO of Van City. Um, thought maybe there might be some alignment there. And also, I'm curious about whether other institutions in Canada or elsewhere are investing in social enterprises, um, particularly co-housing and cooperatives. Yeah, for sure, I can take that question. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, there has been a varied reaction from our board. Um, obviously, the community reinvestment uh, campaign, when the climate emergency campaign kind of was talked about, divestment had yet to be uh, really announced. So it was a little bit more in the background. Um, so in terms of reactions from the Board of Governors, we haven't fully really been able to kind of garner whether they are fully all for it or um, a little bit more hesitant about the these um, kinds of notions. Uh, we have talked really briefly with our treasury about these types of ideas. Um, and we have seen very promising um, kind of like buy-in from certain local asset managers that would potentially be able to do exactly what uh, we are asking for. So really catering a risk and return portfolio while also balancing the social and environmental benefits locally, um, which has been very positive. And as you mentioned, our chancellor, she is a lovely, lovely supporter of the group. Um, and she has obviously uh, very well versed in the social finance space um, and obviously in much support um, of this type of campaign. In terms of if other institutions are doing a sort of similar idea in terms of community reinvestment, uh, we haven't actually been able to find too many other uh, groups, especially within Canada, that are doing something similar, especially at the university level. Um, there are certain labor unions that do um, somewhat of a similar idea, but this is kind of a very new and up and coming thing, especially within the institutional level. Thank you. Thank you. I guess uh, I'm just looking at overall, I was involved in the environmental side of the pulp industry and so on. And I'm, with the present financial situation uh, and the present wars going on, and what do you see, because you are in the student body, do you see that the students uh, are discouraged and not uh, participating as much as they were, say, maybe five years ago, 10 years ago? Or are you seeing that there is a reaction against this and there are more students trying to worry about this issue and coming in the forefront, I would like to know. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, on the community reinvestment side, I don't know if the current economic situation as well as certain um, wars and crises that are happening overseas uh, directly affect uh, participation within the club. We have seen that other movements such as the climate strike movement that happened um, in early 2019 really garner support um, from students as they were able to kind of rally around a global cause. Um, in terms of the students' thoughts on, on what the current uh, ongoing situation is in terms of a potential recession. Um, we have yet to know how that uh, is kind of related to uh, their participation within the club, um, but if you ask my personal opinion, uh, not very hopeful. <laughs> yeah, and I, actually I can speak to this as well. Um, so I had mentioned that last year it was a very small group of, of folks in the club, and now it's grown quite a lot. As I said, close to 50 active members, 150 members in the club. So that's not including the 100 members who maybe aren't as active. Um, so it's, it's quite a large group now. And I've seen uh, two things in, in that time period. I've seen that the, the general student body is experiencing a little bit of that hopelessness, a little bit of that, uh, that eco-anxiety, and, and that greater anxiety as well about the economic situations, about the humanitarian crises around the world, about the political uh, policies in the states, about everything that's happening, right? There's lots of reasons to be upset. But I have noticed that when students join groups, it helps that eco-anxiety is greatly alleviated when they're feeling like they're actually making differences. And so even though 
Sky jokes that she's not very positive. I would <laughs> say that the actually economic. about the economic <laughs> about situation. The, the I would economic say that Sky situation. is actually generally speaking quite positive, and and many of the members <laughs> of 350. I'm contradicting her, but many of many many of the members of 350 uh, are more positive than if they were just reading the news and seeing everything that's going on and not feeling like they were taking any action, and if they were feeling helpless. So there has been uh, there has been a change, a noticeable change over the recent years. Um, because of everything going on, many students do feel hopeless. They do feel like things aren't going to get better. But if they do take actions, if they join groups, if they, if they paint murals, if they march in rallies, they find that that makes them more positive, more optimistic about the future. That's kind of an unspoken positive as well. We, we don't often mention that with 350. We talk about all of our other actions, all of our other campaigns, but we don't often mention the, the student benefit as well. Right? Having students join the group and feeling like they're making a difference is also beneficial. Yeah, I would just, I would just add to that. Um, over my time um, in SFU 350, as we've gotten back on campus as well, I would say um, there's been definitely more of a transition towards hope. Um, because now that you're back in person, you can see the faces of the different student groups on campus, for example. And I said that I would say that there's been a lot more acknowledgement of how interconnected a lot of the work that we're doing is, for example. Um, and I would say that there's also um, an interconnectedness with a lot of global issues and climate change uh, as well. And that's something that we also try to push. So, for example, a lot of the flooding in Pakistan was made worse by climate change for example, and so that is a message that you know, can engage some students. And then if we're presenting them with an option to take action on climate change, then that can alleviate some of that hopelessness that, that you're feeling. And we're always trying to connect it with larger movements um, that are happening both internationally and locally. Um, and so I would say there's been more acknowledgement of, of that interconnection. So people can find multiple different uh, inroads to climate, ch climate change action. Um, in the specific area that they're interested in, whether it's feminism or um, environment or any any um, road, basically. Just gonna add very briefly. Um, I also think it's fascinating to see how many students learn and know about climate equity and justice and how it's different from climate change. Um, so more and more students have been coming definitely on campus, seeing the action happening, and also like SFP 350 providing a platform um, is is ha been really helpful um, for them to you know get over that eco anxiety and also the social media analytics show that there has been <laughs> an improvement in the engagement and I feel like giving them a platform like SFP 350 really alleviates that sort of anxiety and. I see a movement towards uh, more action because after COVID-19, it's been like, you have been locked at home, you are more or less helpless, but after that, you you can do something, you can make a difference. So that feeling, I think, um, is really pushing in students and it's really great to see more and more students around, yeah. Brantley, any other questions from the audience? Okay, I do have a few questions for you three as well. I didn't tell them that I was going to do this, so they don't realize. Sorry, was there a question that I missed? All right, my first question is actually for Paige, put you on the spot. Uh, the question is, what has it been like working with SFU Sustainability for their climate literacy group? Yeah, I would say it's been, I would say it's been really fantastic because um, when I was initially approached with the idea of working with SFU Sustainability, I was worried that it would be um, us following their lead, for example, and us basically providing in input or consultation or um, checking a box on a university initiative um, to engage students, for example. Um, but it's been really uh, fantastic working with uh, some of the staff at SFU Sustainability because it is more of a partnership, and that has been, um, it was unexpected, but I am so excited about that relationship because when we're in meetings, for example, with other student groups in SFU Sustainability, uh, everyone's sitting at the same table. We're all, you know, looking each other in the eye, and they're really wanting to know what students want. So I would say it's been a very, it's been a very pleasant surprise um, working with the Sustainability Office, for sure, and I'm, I'm excited to continue working with them in the future. Awesome. Thank you, Paige. My next question is for Sky. Uh, it's a similar question, actually. So you had mentioned that the Community Reinvestment Group is working with 
uh, organizations like SoulShare or other like financial groups. Have you found that it's easier to work with those groups than with SFU, or have you found it's, there's a similar level of red tape and bureaucracy involved? Um, I actually found that uh, through our consultations that it's been quite easy to get a hold of and engage with these different um, professional groups, um, whether this is local impact investing firms or it's social enterprise, like social en energy. Um, we've been able to reach out to and speak with uh, the C-suites of many different companies, which has been quite nice to quite nice to kind of be involved in the process. Um, and then these, these people are very, very busy and they're very open and receptive uh, to students, uh, asking them questions about impact investing and how an institutional lens could be applied. Uh, so in some ways or another, uh, there has been a lot of less red tape um, for certain people that we have reached out to within the professional sphere. Great. Thank you, Sky. And uh, my third question is for you, Pranjali. And you had mentioned earlier, you, somewhat jokingly, that uh, the, the what's next for the social media group was more reels, more TikToks. So I was actually gonna, gonna ask about that a little bit more. Would you say that uh, the social media team is focusing more on those sort of like short video uh, advertisements almost for the club, as opposed to like the static posts on Instagram and Facebook that we did in the past? Yeah, th thank you for the question. Um, I think there's a lot of static posts in our feed already and um, it's about getting the reach for the students. It's about educating them. It's about the awareness. So we have to like take up the tools. Um, like TikTok, I know there's algorithms. I know there's um, advertisements um, and there's all, all those bad things. Um, but it's important to reach the students in the way that they are best reached out to. So I think, yes, we'll have more TikToks and Reels, but this does not mean we'll not have posts. <laughs> But this does not mean that we will not be informative and um, we will just continue creating awareness even if that means through TikTok and short video platforms do help to get that uh, engagement or get that attention. Um, that's very important for the movement like this. Yeah. Excellent, thank you, Pranjali. Um, so that is actually the conclusion of our Q&A period unless there's other questions from the audience. No, wonderful. I think this is a really good time to um, uh, switch gears a bit and, and have a more informal discussion over food. Uh, it's always nice to have a bit of food. So um, just to, to wind up, I, I'd like to um, congratulate Antonia again. Um, well done for the <laughs> Mahatma Gandhi Annual Student Award. Um, and again, uh, congratulations to SFU 350 in particular, to Liam. Sky, Pranjali, and Paige. Wonderful presentations uh, this evening, and congratulations again. And, and this is, of course, on behalf of the Tacor Foundation, uh, the Institute for the Humanities, the library, and J.S. Woodsworth Chair. So thanks a lot for coming, and uh, look forward to more conversation over food in the back there. Excellent. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us.